Hello, I'm David Ruzik, Illinois Energy Prof. And today I'd like to tell you about a certain class of small modular reactors, the ones that are gas cooled. So, first, just a little background. Some time ago, I recorded a video about a class of reactors called micro modular reactors. All right? And those modular micro reactors were very small. They were making maybe 15 on that order megawatts, right? And, and this is great for some isolated community or a place where you just need one town or one small part. But if we really want to get serious about putting nuclear power on the grid, we need another class. And our government has recognized that, and they've had a competition to be able to see what type of small modular reactors should be developed. And here at Illinois, we actually competed for that, and, and we didn't win, which is okay. I mean, you know, that's what happens. But a couple places that did are what I really want to tell you about today. In particular, the... X Energy's XE100. So the coolest thing about this is the fuel that it uses. It uses a triso fuel. And this fuel, and I'll explain it in detail, but if it gets too hot, it stops working. Also, this reactor can be brought to the site on a truck, a big truck, mind you, but it's modular. So you can have your quality control, you can have your factory that turns out these, and this is going to help in our economics. And this is so unlike the reactors that power the world today, which are always so large, they had to be constructed basically at the site themselves. We also have another design feature of this reactor that it's called a pedal bed. And what's so awesome about this is you kind of drop the fuel on the top, it reacts for a long time, gets completely reacted, falls out the bottom. And this means you can fuel it continuously. You don't have to shut it down for a month and change out fuel rods. It's a high temperature gas cooled reactor, which has a bunch of safety features. And finally, it appears the economics looks good, especially if you just want to make heat. And we'll mention that a little more, too. So first, the fuel. The fuel is the key. So imagine these things, small, like grains of sand, and the actual nuclear stuff, this yellow thing in the middle. That's a ceramic, right? Uranium oxide, uranium carbon oxygen. And what happens with this has a much higher percentage of uranium-235, but it is completely sealed in. You notice the next layer is some kind of porous, you know, spongy kind of material. And that's because if the actual fuel expands some, this porous material can take up that pressure difference. And since this is the part that's going to make the fission products, the nuclear wastes, right, because of that, those fission products are trapped here. And if some of them are gases, that's also trapped in the fuel pellet. There's a very hard layer surrounding it, the silicon carbide, and of course it's surrounded by even more graphite and even more carbon. But it's not just this tiny grain of sand. These tiny grains of sand are packed together in another graphite material, turning into a pebble the size of a golf ball. And this is the fuel. And this is also the container for the nuclear waste. For when this uranium in here is completely used up, this pebble will have reached its way towards the bottom of the reactor. It comes out, and it's its own waste container. Store it on the site if you want, or take it to someplace else and store it and bury it. But you don't have to reprocess it. You don't have to tear it apart. You don't have to risk any of these fission products from getting out. Now. What are all of the advantages? This thing's a solid. 
so it's not going to melt over 2,000 degrees. And since those fission products, even the gases are trapped inside, this will be its own waste container. But the coolest thing, the thing that I've shown here in red, is it has a negative temperature reactivity coefficient. So if we're going along and something happens to the reactor, and if this is the scale for temperature and we're going here in time, all right, and if this suddenly, you know, cooling stops or disaster strikes or tsunami or whatever you want, and it starts getting hotter, the fuel says, no, 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 no. We go down. If my fuel gets hotter, it works less. It will have an automatic, no human intervention needed, just physics stopping itself. All right? Let's remind you about how a nuclear reaction works in the first place. So fission takes place when a neutron, right, hits the uranium. And this then fissions. And it makes more neutrons. And those neutrons that come out are very, very fast. They have to be slowed down. They have to be moderated. Now, you may have heard me talk before, and I talk about Chernobyl having graphite as the moderator. And you might say, oh my gosh, these things have graphite as the moderator. Is that going to be bad? No, it's not going to be bad. You see, there was also the moderator of water, not just in Chernobyl, but in other reactors. And in our standard light water reactors, if the water goes away, the reactor stops because there's no moderator. And you might say, oh my gosh, there's always a moderator here. True. There's no water around at all. So what will happen if the fuel gets too hot is that because of the physics of the uranium-235, which might be at, you know, 15% or so, and the 85% uranium-238, there are resonances, okay? resonances in the cross-section that what will happen is that they will broaden. Doppler broadening, if you've heard of that. And the neutrons will get all absorbed in this part without causing the fissions from this part. When it gets hot, this is favored. And if you look carefully at this cross-section diagram, you'll see that the overlap of the blue and red will be higher than that on the green. So the next aspect is that they're modular. Now, a unit like I'm describing here from uh, X Energy is a unit that will make 200 million watts, 200 megawatts thermal, which if you convert to electricity, is 80 megawatts electric. And its reactor core, the, the piece that they're going to make uniformly in some other location, 70 feet long and about 16 feet in diameter. That's a big truck, but you can still get it there. The reactor concept itself, and I pulled this from Wikipedia, is called a pebble bed. You put in the fuel at the top, eventually it comes out at the bottom. And when you do it this way, you'll be able to burn up virtually all the uranium that's in there. And in time, the stuff that comes out, because, you know, it comes in at the top, it's got to kind of gradually work its way through. It's got high temperature gas going through this. The used fuel will come out of the bottom, all ready to be stored. Here's an actual picture of the gas-cooled reactor design. And I want to point out um, a few things, okay? The first is that's where the fuel's at. And then that's where the fuel comes out eventually. Only helium is in the reactor core part itself, a little unlike the Wikipedia picture you saw. And this has some very important safety advantages. 
because helium, and you know, we're talking the same helium that you fill up a kid's balloon with, that you breathe in and sound like, uh, you know, a squeaky Donald Duck. The helium is chemically inert. And it's already a gas, so it's not going to boil and cause some steam explosion, right? There's no phase change that it can take place with. And then we take the hot helium back out, and it can go over here at 750C, and you can do high-efficiency steam generation for electricity. Or, of course, you could take that heat and just use it as heat. So, what are these safety features that you get because you have a gas-cooled reactor? Passive safety. Helium stops flowing. Well, fuel's going to get warmer. There's nothing taking heat away. But because of the physics of the fuel, it will stop reacting. And you know what you have to do as the operator of the plant or the safety official? Nothing. You simply walk away. In addition, because we have the carbon moderation, all right, which is a very high temperature substance, right? If you think about uh, graphite, you don't get molten graphite, something like 3,500 degrees, it sublimates, but we'll never get that hot because the reactor is designed to stop making power as soon as the fuel heats up too much. Not just design, the physics are that way. So we don't have any phase changes, either of the fuel or of the coolant that can happen in the core. So nothing will be under pressure in an accident situation. And Finally, one of the real keys of these is that their power density is dramatically lower. And therefore, there isn't anything that can melt down. And the containment building can simply be a nice concrete structure that you pour around the reactor core itself. Not some huge 300-foot-tall massive building, but rather a contained structure around each reactor core. So, this overall plant is smaller. The boundary where you could go from here to, say, normal town is much, much closer in. And therefore, you can use these in a lot of different locations. Uh, each one making 80 megawatts of electricity or 200 megawatts of thermal heat. We always come down to this answer, though. All of this sounds great, but how much does it cost? So, their design is to make a unit 200 megawatts thermal, could convert to 80 megawatts electricity. It's higher conversion factor there because it runs at a higher temperature. Carnot efficiency is higher. And they say these designs, very few, if any, work moving parts. I'm not talking about the pump someplace, but rather the reactor core itself, 60-year lifetime. Well, that's great. Almost any capital cost you can amortize over that long <laughs> is going to give you a good deal. But the question is, how good of a deal? So X Energy says that they're going to deliver for the Department of Energy a fuel production facility. Because remember, we got to make this triso fuel. That's a very important part of this. And four of these reactors enough to make 320 megawatts of electricity. And the government is going to give them 1.6 billion over seven years, and they have matching money from the industries that are actually going to help make these products. Okay? So that's the plan. And this will be the first one, and one always imagines the first one is going to cost a bit more. And you might be struck at the price tags of billions, but remember even a big coal power plant costs a billion and natural gas costs billions. And if you're making power plants, get used to the word with a B. It's always in there, all right? The comparison, though, has to be to other sources. So what are the cost details? According to the talk they gave at the 2017 ENS meeting, they show a levelized cost of electricity of 8.4 cents per kilowatt hour. Now, 
I've often said in these other videos that we get maybe around um, three cents for uh, coal and, you know, could even be um, around that or uh, two cents for natural gas, right? And maybe higher for this for wind and other things. But these costs, remember, are um, saying it's perfectly free to put up CO2. Will we have a charge someday for global warming? In which case, the cost for fossil fuels will be deemed too high. If then your choice is to compare this to some of the renewables you see up there, to compare it to solar or to compare it to wind, well, there's lots of economic questions because these systems also need storage. If you are ever going to go to a system that is totally dependent on them alone. So I think where we really end up is the role for nuclear is to have that dependable power when you need to smelt steel, but also for the second knob button that you see there, the real advantage. You see, you could just make heat. So many industrial processes take fossil fuels, and not to make electricity, but just to keep things up. Burning coal, burning methane, burning oil, really good at heating things up. Solar and wind are not real good at that. Solar is photovoltaics, wind powers an electric generator, right? Great at making electricity, not at making heat. A nuclear power plant, on the other hand, could make that heat. And because these are modular and smaller, uh, one of the big power plants we have of these things, remember, these things are 3,000 megawatts thermal. That's the typical size of a power plant. And that is enormous. You don't need that much for any one process factory or maybe any one district heating system. But these modular reactors come in at the 200 megawatt thermal range. And this could be the huge advantage of economic advantage of small modular reactors for the future. So, in conclusion, the future of nuclear, I think, is in these small or even these micro nuclear modular reactors. And I read a thing recently that had just come out. You know, we're shutting down coal plants across the country right and left. We're replacing them with natural gas, but that's good because you make a lot less greenhouse gases. Every place you shut down a coal plant has a steam generator. It has the water sources. It's connected to the electric grid. Instead of burning coal and making the CO2 and the attendant other pollution that comes from that, plop one of these modular reactors or a few of them, at each of those old coal power plant sites and utilize the rest of the benefits. This may be one of the quicker ways to take our electric grid away from CO2 production. And that's what you need to know about small modular reactors.